Nice to uh, meet you all this morning, and thank you for coming. I have a photo that I use to introduce myself, and it's not the most flattering photo that I have of me, but I feel like it best represents uh, what I look like when I'm connecting with other people. And for me, connection is the basis for compassion. If we are connected to other people, we can't help but feel compassionate toward them. And so really, I think that's what we're talking about today, is how can we be more deeply connected with one another and um, be real with that part of what I believe is our human nature. So I'm going to begin by telling a personal story. This is my grandma. <laughs> Uh, and she would be so proud to see me up here today because as a child, she was the lady who took me to art museums throughout my entire life. Um, she wrote poetry, she painted, she was a creative, creative person. She would stop next to the road and we would pick flowers together when we were driving through Nork, which is where I grew up. So a beautiful, beautiful woman, um, not to idealize, her, uh, we're talking about this topic of compassion. I want to be real about the fact that we're all imperfect humans. And if you encountered my grandma in a grocery store and she wasn't able to find what she wanted, um, it might not have been a pleasant interaction. <laughs> she was a little bit of a feisty lady. Um, one thing that I heard about her um, from someone else is that she was the most self-assertive woman that they had ever met. <laughs> So that's something else about my grandma that makes me proud as another strong woman. So we were very, very close, as you might be able to tell from the way that I described her. Um, when I was in college, I lived with her for three and a half years as a young single mother, and she was my rock. She was the person that I turned to in times of difficulty. And times got very difficult for me about four years ago. And some of the things that I was going through were personal. Some of the things that I was going through were professional. Um, one of the hardest things that I was going through was the fact that I was struggling in my marriage. And my husband and I weren't sure if we were going to be able to make it through some of the difficulties that we were facing. And this is something that my grandma knew about. She'd been married on three separate occasions. She got divorced. <laughs> from her first husband uh, to marry her second husband, who then six years later died of cancer, which is what she was dying from in this moment that we were together, um, this moment of my life that was very dark. And it was also very dark for her. So I was in this place emotionally, and she was in this place physically. And through this incredible darkness that we were both facing, we connected with each other on a level that I would describe as deeper maybe than any connection that I've ever had. Um, I felt like I was there to walk through her death process with her. And at one point, she shared with me that I was her lifeboat. And that is still one of the proudest moments of my life. When people are dying, it can be very lonely. People are not happy to talk about losing someone who they love. And so she felt really alienated from a lot of people in her life. And for whatever reason, I felt compelled to be with her in that space and needed to be with her in that space. So one of the things that I was able to experience, and I'm going to talk more about this later, is the sense of transcendence in our interaction with one another. There was a moment in her life when she was leaving this place that we were in. And I had my hands on her body, and I was watching her make this journey out of this world. And I knew from the moment that she left that she was still with me, still present in this space. And I feel it every day of my life. I feel it in um, the charm bracelet that she has been making for me since I was 10 years old. <laughs> uh, I feel it in the tokens and the talismans that I keep in my home, and I feel it in my heart. And so that's what I want to talk about today, is creating the experience of such deep connection that it transcends our physical presence in this world because I feel like that's what we're really here for. So we live in this society, though, that doesn't really embrace this. We operate on the myth that we are separate individuals, that we are self-sufficient, that we can do this on our own. And it's not true. 
but it causes a lot of damage. So this, raise your hand if you've seen this before, is Maslow's hierarchy, right? And what does it end with? Self-actualization. When I become the best person that I can become, I have done what I am here to do in this world, right? So we live by this. So what does this mean? It means that we worship busyness. It means that we don't have time to sit and pause with people in a real way, which is a prerequisite to being compassionate. If you cannot pause, if you cannot recognize where the person is who is right in front of you, there is no chance that you are going to be able to connect with that person and therefore have a compassionate experience. But we worship busyness, right? I'm so busy, I don't have time for this. We have conversations while we're staring on our cell phones. So this is one of the obstacles from, that we encounter because we're operating within this myth. We also operate from a place where our status, our financial um, status, and, and also our personal status drive the decisions that we make every day. Um, in a scientific term, this is called materialistic value orientation. And it basically means that we, more than anything, value the ways that we present ourselves to others and the ways we are able to accumulate wealth and accumulate power. So this leads to depression, it leads to anxiety, it leads to a lower quality of life, and we know this from the research, and yet we operate within this myth. The third thing that stops us from being compassionate, the third obstacle that I wanna talk about is our fear of connecting with the people in front of us. So James Hanahan wrote the novel Delicious Foods. Uh, if you wanna be disturbed, I highly recommend that you read it. <laughs> It's a very good book, uh, but one of the things that he talks about in the book uh, through a character, there's this quote, and I use it all the time. The people in power use their stories to create a wall blocking out others' truths. So why would we do that? We do that because we are afraid. If we see that the other person sitting in front of us has all of the same desires, all of the same wishes, all of the same thoughts that we have, then we have to feel their pain like we feel our own. And that hurts, and we don't wanna do it. And so we push that pain away, and we pretend like we don't see it. And we all do this, we all do this in our lives. I have done this in my own life, I've done it with my family, I've done it with friends, I've done it with people that I don't know. And I can guarantee you that this too is part of the human experience. And so part of becoming compassionate is getting to the place where we can see those, those walls in our own lives and begin to inquire and ask ourselves why, why, why are these walls there? So all of this leads to a tremendous amount of pain. We live in a society where self-sufficiency is supposed to be a given, and it's not. And so those of us who are weaker in some way, physically, emotionally, mentally, become excluded from the rest of society, become unseen, because it's too painful to be connected in that way. So I want to give you a little taste of connection and give you an experience of sort of playing with the idea of pausing. So we're gonna take a moment, we're gonna do that right now. Um, you're gonna need to find a partner, so if everybody can find a partner. If you don't have one, you have to partner with me, so <laughs> work hard at it. <laughs> I can't stand. So, well, so introduce yourself to your partner. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's, that's kind of weird right now. I'm gonna ask you to be totally silent for 30 seconds and look into the face of the person with whom you are paired. So this is totally silent, no talking at all. And I'm going to be counting to 30, so you might feel like it's longer, but keep going until I say to stop. Okay, so we are starting... We are starting now.
Okay, so first of all, I lied. I actually started a conversation and forgot to count. So if you were counting, I hope that was about 30 seconds. So would anyone in the room like to just in a word describe what that experience was like? Awkward. Okay. Cool. Cool. Intimate. Intimate. What was that? Intense. Intense. Expansive. Mmm, expansive. Embarrassed. Embarrassed. Novel. Novel. Pleasant. Pleasant. So, when was the last time that you did this? Raise your hand if. You looked at someone silently for 30 seconds any time in the last day. Okay, a few people, week, year. Okay, so I said year, and we still have a lot of hands that haven't been raised, right? Does that sound fair? So my point in having you do this is that we are very uncomfortable with the idea of pausing. And we are pretty uncomfortable with sitting in this space of being vulnerable and intimate with another human being. So this is a skill. It's something that we have to actually build in ourselves. I believe that compassion is our true nature, but I also believe that we are living in a society that puts up many obstacles to being able to connect with that part of ourselves. So I'm gonna encourage you to continue this experiment and to continue to pause and be comfortable with silence when you are with other people. Because um, there's something that's actually revealed in that space. There's a deeper way of knowing that doesn't just come from the conversations that we're having with the people around us. Oh. I'm stuck. No? Okay. Well. So, oh, thank you. So the reality, um, we're gonna switch gears here, is that humans are a social species. We are wired to connect with one another. So this is not just you know, this frou-frou, fluffy, ethereal idea that's floating in the sky. It's actually based upon the fact that we are far more connected with one another than we believe. So before I go into describing more of why I believe that, believe that I'm going to tell a personal story. So this is my youngest son, Sawyer. I have two children. I have a son who's 17 and a son who is seven. In this picture, he's five, and you can see that he is giving this tree the I love you symbol, sort of, he's brushing the bark of this tree with his hand. And so um, before I went through this experience, and particularly watching the death of my grandma, I, like many people, was not connected in some of my closest relationships, including my relationships with my children. And so this picture is a really good example of how that changed for me. I was uh, down at Greg's Reservoir walking along the river with my husband and my youngest son. And I was sitting on a log and touching the bark of this tree. And I was actually thinking about someone, something that someone had said in one of my very first workshops that I ever did, which is that when he went on runs now, because he had started a mindfulness practice and because he had learned to slow down, he had begun to notice the pattern of bark on the trees, and he thought it was really just beautiful. And so this was something that he had shared with me, and I was literally having that thought and had my hand on the bark of the tree. And my youngest son comes up to me, and he says, Mama Mia, which is what my kids call me, um, <laughs> what are you telling that tree? And you know, I did what you do when seven-year-olds ask you a question like that, which is I made up something cute. And so I said, I'm telling the tree that I love it. And he said, well, I want to tell the tree that I love it too. And so he figured out a way to do that that included saying I love you as he ran his fingers down the bark of the tree and then petting the tree and then saying I love you again. And so this started this relationship with trees that my son and I share. 
And so we live in Grandview, which is not a rural community. And yet, um, sometimes when we are coming home from school, you might find the two of us literally hugging a tree. <laughs> which is, you know, for us, fun. For my 17-year-old son, like, the most embarrassing thing. He's like, what did you do to my brother? Like, he's such a weirdo, right? <laughs> And also, I, I should pause and say, I could not be more stereotypical with this story. I mean, I'm fulfilling like all of your visions of what someone who teaches mindfulness does, right? I'm literally hugging trees. <laughs> so I, I love this story because in order to have this moment, I had to slow down. And I had to be present in the world of a small child, which is just this like magical, crazy place that's so different than our adult world. And so being present with him in this moment comes from the fact that I have worked on this part of myself through my mindfulness practice, through recognizing that I was existing within these myths, these ideas that don't really matter, and then through really reaching out and being vulnerable and connecting with other people. So this is a journey that I've been on, and I know that change is possible. Um, I am a very different person than I was four years ago, and I could tell you many embarrassing stories, and sometimes I do in my workshops. Fortunately, that's not what we're talking about today, so we'll move on. So this is a quote from Matthew Lieberman, who is a researcher. And the quote says, to the extent that we can characterize evolution as designing the modern brain, this is what our brains were wired for, reaching out and connecting with others. This is actually the truth, OK? And we don't hear that often enough. But through our systems, we're like these weak, pale, you know, puny things that can't be outside without clothes, that have to wear sunscreen, right? That you know have to be inside most of the time because we're not weather resistant. And somehow, we have come to be this species that's just absolutely incredible. The things we create are amazing. And we do that because our nature is to be connected to one another. This is how we have survived. And this is how we have thrived. And I believe it's time to get back to that reality. So I think we need a refreshed vision. So I'm going to revisit something that we saw before. And I had mentioned this idea of transcendence. I like, didn't make up that word, obviously. Um, other people have said this word before. And I'm going to tell you something about this system that we believe in, this Maslow's hierarchy. This is actually not what Maslow believed. By the end of his life, he had revised this system and decided that there was another level above self-actualization. And that level was self-transcendence. We are believing a myth that the actual creator didn't even believe by the end of his life. He, like most people, became wise as he grew older and figured out that there were other things that were more important. So I think our reality is really, to go back to trees, <laughs> A lot more like trees, we kind of think of them as these individual creatures. You know, you see a tree and you think of it as this single organism. And that's actually not true. So going back to the research again, uh, trees underneath of the soil have these very complex root systems. And they are connected to one another in this really incredible way. So there are these trees that are called mother trees or hub trees. And they even send, when they are damaged, signals to the trees around them to let them know that there's danger. They send them wisdom. They share resources. They share water. They share carbon dioxide. And all of this is happening under the surface in a place that we can't see. And I think this is more of what our reality actually is. Maybe we don't see that in our everyday, and so we question whether it's there. But it is. So. One of the ways that we can experience transcendence is through cultivating a state of awe. So astronauts who go into space have this experience, right? It's pretty awe-inspiring to see the Earth from really far away. And what's really magical about this is after they have this experience, it changes them. So before they go, they have self-focused goals, like many of us do. And then they come back, and instead, they're more focused 
on connection and how they can improve the whole because they've seen the reality of the fact that we're living on this incredibly small speck of dirt that's floating through space, that's delicate, that's fragile, that what really matters is the fact that we are all in this together. And it actually changes their behavior when they come back. It changes their lives. You don't have to have these big, grand moments and go into space to experience this. Um, we're in the Columbus Art Museum, so this is very apt. Art is one of the things that can instigate within us a sense of transcendence. So this is actually a public art exhibit. I just went to Montreal with my husband. You might recognize this face because it's the same face that I'm making on the slide that I showed you earlier. <laughs> So I was obviously having this great moment of connection. These bikes um, play different instruments as you pedaled them. And so this gentleman and I are playing a song together. And you can't see this, but outside of where we were playing this song, there's a crowd of people who are all watching this. So connection happens in these really small moments. And as creatives, we can build this. We can build these experiences. And as humans, we can cultivate this in our daily lives. So I'm not talking about anything new. As I said, this is not a new vision. This is a refreshed vision. This is something that we've known throughout history. We live in a time right now where there's a lot of things to not want. There are a lot of things to be against. There are symbols in this world of hate and darkness that many of us would like to take down. So my call to action is not just to be against something. It is to be for something. And that's what this is about. One of my favorite books of all time is John Lewis's Walking in the Wind. Um, he marched with Martin Luther King, is an amazing civil rights activist that is still active today. And in his book, in his memoir, he talks about the basis of nonviolent action and how it's built from this profound foundation of love. And not just love of the people that I like and not just love of the people who agree with me, love of the people who are trying to destroy me. And what is that love like? How powerful is that force. This is the ultimate in self-transcendence. So I wonder what the world would be like if we were to look back to our ancestors, folks like my grandma, folks like John Lewis, Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Gandhi, these folks who knew deeply in their bones that this is what we are made for and to live through that model, to live through the teachers who have been here before, what would that be like? So I empower each of you to think more about that reality in your own lives. The work is always 20 feet from you, always. So it's your families, it's your friends, it's the guy you're sitting next to on the bus, it's the person who's serving you your coffee. That's your work. So start there. There is nowhere else to start. Um, I'm going to leave you with one final skill that you can take with you after you go from this place. And this is a practice that has been shown to increase our sense of happiness and also increase our desire to be altruistic and generous. So we're not going to go through this entire practice together, but I'm going to give you a taste of it. So if you just want to kind of get comfortable in your seat, uncross your legs, Put your hands on your knees or your thighs somewhere so that you kind of have an open posture. Take a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. And if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes. And we're going to send some wishes to ourselves right now. So if you can repeat silently with me, May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I find peace. So noticing how that feels in your body to send yourself those wishes. 
knowing that all sentient beings have this same wish and these same desires. And then taking a deep breath in through your nose, out through your mouth. And bring into your mind the face and the being of the person with whom you have recently connected, your partner for looking. And send them these same wishes, knowing that they have the same desires and hopes that you have. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you find peace. Noticing how that feels in the body. And then taking one final really deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. And we're going to one more time go through this practice and we're going to include this time all sentient beings, the people in this room, in this city, in this country, in this world, sending them these same wishes. May we be happy. May we be healthy. May we find peace. And when you're ready, you're taking one final breath. Maybe wiggling your fingers and your toes, stretching a little bit if you'd like. And when you're ready, opening your eyes. So this is something you can do. This is something you can teach to others. This is something you can carry with you that, again, has been shown through research to help us to be more compassionate toward others in our daily lives. So I want to thank you all for sharing your time with me. This has truly been an honor. <laughs> thank you.